Well, it's a, a real privilege and pleasure to be here. What a wonderful thing. It's the first time, apart from when I've been on my own, that uh, I've been in a context able to worship unmasked. We all who with unveiled faces. I love that verse. We all with unveiled faces beholding the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory into the likeness of Christ. It's unveiled faces. Tonight. And it's just beautiful, isn't it? I've missed it, and this is the first time, and what a wonderful time it is. And thank you to the band, the worship was fantastic. I wish it could have gone on, and then Cookie come back and said, you're not on, we're just going to worship. That would have been a good evening for me, that would have been perfect. Cookie was being very gracious a minute ago by not um, giving away the fact that when he rang me up this week and said, we're really looking forward to you coming, I went, what? <laughs> and I'd completely forgotten. I hadn't written in my diary. I had no recollection of it whatsoever. And I said, can't wait, can't wait. Can't remind me, well, well, what is happening again? <laughs> and I was just delighted that it wasn't uh, all weekend that I was committed to, because I was committed somewhere in Northampton today, that, uh, where I've come from. Anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Cookie, and thank you, Will, and uh, thank you, Frog and Amy. What a wonderful place that in faith you've created here, and uh, the Lord shining on the just today. Well, if you've got a Bible, please can, can you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I, I just want to draw out a couple of points from 2 Corinthians 6, one from 6 and one from 7, chapter 7. That's where we're going to go today. I uh, grew up in a Christian home, and uh, I believed in God. You know, I was sort of born into a family where we did God, and my family were very religious, so several generations of brethren preachers, and then strict Baptist pastors, and so I was sort of weaned on religion, but it didn't stick, it, it didn't take. And uh, though I believed in God, I never knew him. And I would talk to him when I was in trouble, but, but we weren't friends. And uh, throughout my teens, I sort of pulled away, didn't want anything to do with church, anything to do with God. To be perfectly honest, I was embarrassed by the religion of my parents and grandparents. And, and I went to, as far away from being a kind of practicing Christian as one can be. And... Uh, Yet despite that, God kind of relentlessly pursued me. God pursued me. I turned my back on God. I just wasn't interested. I didn't want anything to do with him whatsoever. And yet God constantly and graciously and full of mercy and tenderness, he chased after me. I remember checking up a girl in the pub, or at least trying to on a Friday night, and uh, said something like, you know, hello babe, you want to come with me and I'll show you the way to heaven, or something like that. <laughs> I was an evangelist, even though I didn't know it, and I said something like that, and she just said, you need God. And I thought, what do you want about this Friday night? I don't need God. Anyway, I was so shaken by it, I remember leaving. It was raining, it was raining in North Somerset. And I, I, I remember going and going into uh, uh, an underpass and sitting there, rolling up a cigarette, smoking, thinking, you need God, you need God, what on earth is going on? This is madness. But it was actually a grace, and God was reaching out to me. I always wanted to be a soldier, join the army when I left school, and they kicked me out, and I had a bad spine and I had a, 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 a plaster cast from my groin to my neck and I was in a club playing pool, sort of trying to play pool, he got a full wallet plaster cast and there was a bloke and uh, and he said, what's up to you? I said, oh I don't know, man. I got some problem in my back, nearly kicked me out the army. He said, I know someone who can heal that and I said, who, God? He went, yeah, if you want me to pray for you, I went, no, I don't want anything to do with God. And there was another bloke in this club, I really liked this bloke, he, 
he was uh, an ambulance man and, and um, he was kind of gritty but really cool and I, I really warmed to him, he was a few years older than me. One day he said, do you want to come around my house? I thought, what's happening, there's a party. I said, yeah, when, what's happening? He said, well, I'm, I'm getting together a few lads and we're going to read the Bible. I thought, the Bible? Are you kidding me? No. There was a, a, a woman I used to see. I was working as a butcher in those days. I'd see her quite often. Whenever I saw her, she was like doubly nice. I thought she fancied me. She was the wife of this ambulance man didn't fancy me, she was praying for me. Every time she saw me, yes, we're going to get you. And this just went on, one thing after another. I was in a, we got young people in the room, I was in a very sordid context. And, and I heard the audible voice of God, I've only heard it a few times. This was one of them. God said, what are you doing here? And I jumped out of bed, wrapped myself up and thought, what am I doing? We're trying to give money to a busker. Well, in Bristol. I'm trying to give him money. He said, oh, I don't want your money. But you can't keep running from God. I thought, do you want to kick in the teeth or what? What's going on there? I'm trying to give you money. It was just one thing after another. One grace after another. God pursued me. And then one day I was sat, literally, the irony of it, I was sat on a fence. <laughs> I was sat on a fence at a cricket ground. I'm having this fag. And suddenly I saw a vision. I'm not a Christian. And I had a vision of me teaching children the story of Jonah. And I said to the kids, you can't ever run away from God. And I'm preaching a sermon to myself in a vision to these kids thinking what is going on and then in the distance I saw an Anglican church and that voice again said I want you to go there and I said God I'm never going there I'm never going to church again I've given up on church leave me alone and PS if I ever went to church it wouldn't be Anglican it would be Baptist that's what our family does but go away and then this is, all, this is over a year or two, all these incidents, I'm driving in a car. And, well, I was in the passenger seat, and a friend of mine, I just reconnected with. I must have said something that was really bang out of order, and he just said, you're, fu you're disgusting, man. And I either hit him, or got out, and he was driving, and I said, stop the car. And I got out, and we were outside this Anglican church that I'd seen in this vision. And I heard this music coming out. I was used to f sort of four miserable hymns, you know. And I heard this beautiful sound. And I walked into the church. I haven't been in the church for so long. And I walked in all unkempt, with long hair. You know? <laughs> and I was just bathed in love. I just thought, God, there is a God and he's in this place. And it was full, that surprised me. I was used to half a dozen people. And it was young people. And then they began singing in tongues. I didn't, I'd never heard that. Obviously I hadn't heard that before. But uh, somewhere from my childhood, that verse that they speak in the voice of men and angels, yet have not love, and I thought, this must be like angels. Singing, am I tripping? What is this? It's angels. And it was amazing. And I began shaking violently. I thought, I better get out. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. And all week the sound was there and the feeling of the presence of God and just this inexorable drawing to God who wouldn't let me go. And I'd done my utmost to run. And the following week, I remember I was with the guys and they said, you're at the pub tonight. I said, no, I'm going to church. They went, Whoa. I said, no, I really am. I went home, put on my best cowboy boots, best leather waistcoat, wash my hair, clean my teeth. Went to church to meet God. And there again in the worship. And there was a sermon about God's love. And about Jesus dying for our sins. And that I could be forgiven. And I could be ordered rightly towards God. And put right in myself. And, and I just, I was drawn. And I went forward. At the end it was an appeal for prayer. You know, I'd never seen anything like that. I just went and I prayer. And I gave my life to the Lord. I never got over the wonder of it all. 
for I'm a vicar today. And the amazing thing is that when I got up and turned around, that woman who kept smiling at me in the butchers that I thought fancied me was sat there. And the woman from the pub who said, you need God, was sat there. And the man from the pool hall was sat there. And they'd all be praying for me. This rough guy in Nails East North Somerset for years. And I, I got saved. What an amazing thing. Jesus was pursuing me. Now we all have different stories, but at the heart of them, the core of them is a God who pursues us and he's just drawing us to himself and he's working out ways to get in our face and let us know how much he loves us and wants to put things right in our life. He is the God who pursues us. So I've got two points, let's get to the Bible. You don't just wanna hear from me. And the first is that God is a pursuing God who's pursuing you. This is dead simple tonight. I, I'm a vicar in Oxford, so we're used to dead simple. God is pursuing you. Turn over actually to chapter 7 and verse 1. And it says this, Since we have these promises, beloved, some of your translations will say, Dear friends, but the original says, Beloved, agape. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit and perfect in holiness out of reverence for God. Since we have these promises, Beloved, what promises? Well, flip back to chapter 6 and verse 4. Where should we start? Verse. 16 halfway through for we are the temple of the living God you just got to hold that for a minute you are the temple of the living God we don't have to go anywhere to meet him he's come all the way from eternity to live in us as God said I will live with them and walk among them and I'll be their God and they'll be my people and then it goes on, come out and be separate and touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. I will be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dearly beloved, we are a people pursued by a God who covers us in promises and who showers us with his love. There are seven things there. I, 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 I've not preached this before. I saw it this week and so this is a good opportunity to have a go at it. There are seven things there that God wills. He says, I will live with them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. I will welcome them. I will father them. And they will be my sons and daughters. How about that? I mean, really, saints, how about that? The world hasn't got anything that gets anywhere near any of that. Like nothing. I did my studies years ago on a great theologian, a Swiss theologian called Karl Barth. And he said this, God doesn't will to be God for himself. He doesn't will to be God alone with himself. But he wills as God to be for us who are not God. He doesn't will to be himself in any other way than in relationship with us. That was a long theological sentence, but it simply means God wants us. God chooses us. God desires us. And God goes out of his way to get us in his family. And God, the Lord and sovereign creator of the universe, perfect in himself from all eternity, wants you with him. More miraculous than that, he wants to live in you. God isn't pie in the sky when we die. And he's not, as that great country and western song goes, watching us from a distance. God is not watching you from a distance. He is a God who's moved towards you. 
in love. And he's not seeking to hide from you. And he's not playing hide and seek with you. He is a God who wills to be known by you. And wills to walk with you. Right from the start, when he creates Adam and Eve, he comes every day, in the cool of the day, not the heat of the day, in the cool of the day, to walk with them. It's always been his desire to do that. From all eternity, he creates a place and configures it in time and space and constitutes everything perfectly and then makes someone in his image, people, so that he can come and love them and be with them and be for them and just bless them. And he gives us free will so we can respond freely to his willing and yet we choose against that. And ever since our first forefathers said, now we'll try it our own way, we've messed this planet up. Humanity has been messed up. And did God say fair dues? I'll blow the whole thing up and start again. No, he banishes them from the garden, then he accompanies them out. And the whole of biblical history tells us that God chases us through the corridors of history to be with us. And he goes out of the way. He goes all the way. He goes to hell and back to bring us back into relationship with him. What an amazing story. No wonder we see. The creation is God pursuing you. And then preeminently the incarnation is God pursuing you. The crucifixion is God pursuing you. The story is God pursuing you. It's like a water frank on every page. What is this book all about? What are all those weird chapters in Exodus or Leviticus, Numbers? What are all those weird things about sacrifices and ritual and temples and priests? And this? What's it all about? What are the prophets all about coming and saying stuff? It's all about God working and willing to get in your way and to take you to be with him and to accompany him. I love him. God is pursuing you. And he didn't just pursue you. And once you say yes to him, he says, thanks very much, and I'm going on to the next one. <laughs> he wants to accompany you every day of your life and be with you. He's never been reluctant. He's never been indifferent. He's never been distant. It's us that are. I did a funeral just before lockdown for an amazing bloke. He was a documentary writer and uh, had, he'd been the head of Oxfam. He was an ama just an amazing guy, the most amazing guy I ever met. And uh, when he was dying of cancer, he wasn't a particularly religious man, although he had a, a, a personal faith, he, 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 but he didn't attend church or out like that. And um, he would talk to me all the way through his chemotherapy. And then when he passed away, his daughter contacted me. My dad left instruction on you to bury him. One daughter, do his funeral. Anyway, when I visited the family, they told me an amazing story. I said, what was he like? Tell me some stuff about him. I only knew him from the coffee shops and that. And a brilliant mind and a leader. And he said, um, I love the smell of dogs in church. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, so, yeah, and you agree, yes. Where was I? Oh yeah, this bloke, wonderful bloke called Richard Stanley. And his daughter said to me, well, this is the kind of bloke he was. When my sister got engaged, shortly thereafter, two weeks after, she went to a rock concert like Nebworth or something like that. And uh, when she got back, she realized she'd lost her engagement ring at a concert for like 30,000, 50,000 people camping. Imagine that. And the father said, okay, I want you to draw me on the map. Here's a map. I want you to tell me every place you went, where are the loos? Where were you camp? Where did you park? Which of the concerts you went to? Which of the stadiums you were at? And then he rang around all his mates. 
and he hired numerous metal detectors and he called all his mates in and they all piled down in the minibus and, the, and they searched everywhere for the lost engagement ring and he found it. I mean, if any of you have ever been to a place like that, I've been to some of these places. The, the odds on that are rather miraculous, you know what I mean? I haven't got enough numbers in my head to work with. It's miraculous. And when I heard that, I thought, this is an amazing man. And that is an echo of an amazing God who goes out of his way and goes all the way to find us. That's what God is like. He says, I will be a father to them and I'll live with them and walk among them and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Isn't that epic? I mean, that is epic. That, that is. I like what the American author Louis Giglio says. He says, God is always seeking you. Every sunset, every clear blue sky, every ocean wave, the starry hosts of the night, he blankets each new day with the invitation here I am. Every morning when the sun comes up and you wake up, God says, here I am. The great philosopher Kierkegaard actually said, you loved me first. And when I turn to you in prayer, you are already there. His love beat us to it. And so Paul here, in 7 verse 1, says, since we have these promises, all the things God wills, dearly beloved. And that's, that's the greatest of them. Why does he do it all? What is the presupposition of it? Because he loves us. I'd like you to do something for me. This is the end of my first point. I've only got two. You're pleased to hear them. I know that. I'd like you to point the finger at yourself and say, God, and say out loud, God loves you. And then I want you to say it again say, He really loves you. Yeah. Really loves you. Didn't you feel better doing that? You, start, you were smiling initially, you thought, idiot. Uh, but then you, I could see that. It just it was good. He loves you. What, me? Yeah, you. He, he really does. And He will. Look at them seven wills. You might find eight in there, but seven's a you know, he loves you. He wills to be with you. And he pursues you. And then the second thing that I was thinking this week, looking at this passage, was this. That we've got to pursue the pursuer. We've got to pursue the pursuer. Years ago, there were, there were Christian books that were very popular. And they're good. I've read them several times. One called The Pursuit of God. How about that? Good book, A.W. Tozer. There's another one, I've forgotten the author's name, you'll know it, called God Chasers. And uh, there's another book, it wasn't very good, it was called The Pursuit of the Holy. Yeah, I wrote that one. And um, it didn't sell. But here's the thing in all of those, there's a kind of emphasis and onus on us to pursue God, us to chase God, us to pursue the holy. And I think that that might be something that could just improve those amazing works that it just begins with God pursues us it starts with him like I said he isn't hiding from us and asking us to seek him it's we like Adam who so often hide and God who seeks us saying Adam where are you he knows where we are but he's just gutted that we're hiding but then we respond to the one who pursues us by pursuing him. And how do we do that? Well, Paul here says, verse 17, come out and be separate. Now, I grew up in a religious context and that meant I have nothing to do with anyone in the world. Well, that's rubbish. Jesus loved the world and, and was in it. You know, and in fact, the religious judgment on Jesus was that he, he wanted to hang around with tax collectors and sinners and, and so on. But we've got to somehow separate ourselves from some active sin. 
since we have these promises, verse 1 of chapter 7, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates our body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of awe for God. God loves us first, and he invites us and desires us to love him back. If you visit one of the royal homes, you know, Windsor or Bucky Palace or Sandringham or whatever, when the Queen is in residence, there's a flag flying. It says, there's royalty here. And, the, and I, bet, I bet they know the royals are there. And I bet all the household staff think, uh-oh, Queen's coming. Let's, let's get busy, get the toothbrush out and clean the drive and make sure that Lou doesn't pong and all of that stuff. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, hands up who thinks, nah, they just leave it scruffy. No, exactly. They think, the Queen's coming. The Royals are coming. This is her home. She's coming to stay. Let's get things right. And the text here says, you're the temple of the living God. The king has come to stay. The king's come to stay forever. It's not a passing visit. And we've got to get things right. We're God's temple. The king of kings is in residence. And we've got to make him feel at home. And how do we do that? Paul here, in just a pithy way, tells us. And there are just two things. Let me just highlight two things. And I came up with two words, and I don't like either of them, really. Um, but that's all I've got. You can make up your own if you go up and think about it. And the first is that it tells us to remove stuff. And secondly, it tells us to improve. Remove and improve. What he doesn't do is reprove us. Not having a go. He doesn't lay it on thick. He doesn't pile it on and stick the boot in and say, you filthy sinners, what you no, he doesn't do any of that. He sets a standard. The context is God's come to live in you. So then, what do we do? Well, we respond to him who loves us. And the first is we remove. He says, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates. The word there for purify means purify. <laughs> it just means like wash, wash stuff away. Get clean. And he wouldn't tell us to do something that we couldn't do. He wouldn't tell us to do something that couldn't be done. Get clean. Come on. The king's in residence. The king's in residence. Make him feel at home. And we cleanse ourselves. We don't expect someone else to do that. We don't expect the priest to pray for us. And just him do it all for us. You know, the medieval church, the, the monks would be paid to go and do penance for someone else. We, we, we've got to do it ourselves. We do it in community. We do it with those that we love and respect and we share with and they stand with us. And they, but we've got to do it. I remember years ago, someone coming to see me and say, I've got a real problem. I suddenly realized we've got lots of young people in here. I've got a real problem with X, Y, Z. And he said, will you pray for me? I said, no, it's your problem. You pray for yourself. And I remember he was completely shocked. It's like, you're a priest. You're speaking at the conference. What are you doing? I thought, you have had this problem for years. And I can't stop your problem. And you've had hundreds of people saying prayers for you, but you haven't dealt with it. And what you have to do, you've got to confess it to God. You've got to confess it to your wife. Then you've got to address what you confess. You've got to go and deal with it. Go and purify. You go and deal with it. I told him that. He was not happy. We didn't talk again. But I, I think I'm right. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But purify yourselves. We can't get us, ourselves right with God. We can't justify ourselves. That's a work that only God can do. But actually the work of becoming more like him is one that we do in partnership. And often, certainly in our Protestant tradition, people balk at that. They, they balk at these imperatives, but actually there are hundreds of them in the New Testament. Things that God says, come on. And he doesn't say it in an aggressive way or a hostile way or I won't do this if you don't do that kind of way. He's already done everything for us. He just says, come on. Come on. We can do better about that. 
We can do better. I've been a minister for 30 years. And uh, I'm, I know myself, I've been married 33, I know, I know what I'm like. So many of us have just got stuff that shouldn't be there. Haven't we? Come on. Is that, is that true or, or not? I mean, I know some of you look pretty good, but uh, perfect. Listen, we've all got stuff. And, you know, the old word is sin, but we've all got this stuff and this stuff that gets in the way. That messes us up, that messes others up through us, and that just spoils our relationship with God. And we've got to sort it out. Grace is not opposed to effort, said Dallas Willard. It's opposed to earning. Salvation is free, but becoming holy is something that we work at ourselves. Don't expect others to do it. Purify yourselves. So as I said, I've been writing this this week. I'm still working it out. And, uh, but I, I wrote to, and I spoke to my wife. I spoke to the Lord. I wrote to my best friend. And I wrote to my closest colleague. And I asked all four the same question. What's wrong with me? What do you think's wrong with me? And I'm not asking you. Don't you tell me I can <laughs> so I asked them who knew me. I said, look, you know me. You've worked with me for years. Tiffany, you've been married to me for decades. God, you've known me since the, before I was conceived in my mother's womb. What, what do I need to work at? Purify yourselves. I was surprised by the response. God was the nicest. <laughs> I mean, he was. He just said one thing. He did, he just said one thing, and I loved that. He didn't point out, he didn't point out, I was expecting them, you know, go deep into my inner psyche, he just told me one, but it was a big thing. It was, but it was a kind of big principle thing. And I thought, wow. And then Tiffany, who loves me, my wife Tiffany, just was so kind, but she said about three or four things. <laughs> and, then I said, no, I don't think you understand. She said, oh, well, I'll tell you some more then. <laughs> yeah, I said, no, no, stop, no, that, no, no, listen to the question. Um, <laughs> and my two mates, they really got stuck in. <laughs> and I wasn't, I didn't appreciate it. I actually feel a bit wounded. I think, well, if you think that, what, what are you doing? Why, why haven't you spoken that into my life? And why are you not helping? But we're all work in progress. We all who with unveiled faces beholding the glory, that's how we're going to get more like him. We've got to look more at him. If you want to look like him, you've got to look at him. As we look at him beholding his glory, by the spirit we are transformed from one degree of glory into his likeness. We've got to spend more time with him. We've got to spend more time worshiping, more time looking at him in order that we can look like him. But it was a painful exercise, but we've got to do that. If we're to purify ourselves, we've got to know ourselves. If we've got to know ourselves, we've got to go to God who knows us better than anyone, to his word that is a plumb line for us, and to those who are near and dear. It was a painful exercise. I'm not going to do it again. And it might take me a lifetime to sort it out. In fact, I said to the one colleague who said, this is your issue. And I wrote back, I said, this is absolutely true. I said, me? I said, how do I deal with that? And he said, lifetime. <laughs> so lifetime. He thought, thanks for that, it's not very helpful. And, um, <laughs> and then it goes on. Listen, I don't want to lay it on thick here. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates But We can't hold stuff back. We can't say, yeah, I agree. I think, I think purity is a really important thing, but I just want to hold one or two little indulgences for myself. Thank you very much. He said, no, everything, everything, that's not right. The word there actually for contaminate is literally the word to smear. I think it's a really evocative word for sin there. And it's, it's molasmos. How about that? Just, smear, just smeared. Just smeared on you. Get rid of everything that's smeared on you. And then it says, in body and spirit. You see that? So it's not just the outside stuff. It's not just the stuff we do with our body and our kind of 
physicality in, in, in you know in our relationship with others that others are able to see it's not just it's that in our body and our spirit it's the it's the stuff inside too it's the thoughts and the secrets of our hearts and the resentments and the, the, te- the, the lusts and the, it's that stuff inside body and spirit smeared outside and in sort it all in COVID lockdown, Cookie lost weight. I gained weight, <laughs> and uh, but I did a lot of jobs. I really, I became Mr. Fix It. Honestly, I'm rubbish, but it's an amazing what you can do with a tub of Gorilla Glue. <laughs> and honestly, I felt I was really. I thought this is easy. I can do this stuff. You know what I mean? Just, you know, glue. I was mending. Every, I was gluing everything together. You know? <laughs> but honestly, drawers, and I was mending locks, and I was oiling. So, it was brilliant. I was really impressed with myself at all these things. But the things I knew about a kind of kitchen drawer falling off and a rattly handle, and I was painting. But th- these were sort of externals. But all the while, I could hear stuff going up above my bedroom in the eaves. And some rooks had got in there. And they removed the barbed wire that was kind of blocking up a vent hole. And then they'd come in and they'd set up camp and put a nest. And suddenly just the place is full of scratching and then babies screeching and then fights with other crows outside my bedroom. And they're dropping all these bits every day. Birds swooping. And of course once they've nested, you're not allowed to get anyone in to kill them. You're not allowed to do it. I mean, you're not allowed to do it. I'm not saying that. <laughs> you might be tempted. But you're not allowed. They're nesting. I like that sort of environmental compassion of thing. Despite the screeching and scratching above your head. But I've done all these sort of external and little things. But I, I, got, I got them rooks in. In the eaves, just inside, above my bedroom, making a mess. What are the things in our lives that where we've allowed them in? And they're chipping away, scratching, screeching, having babies reproducing themselves <coughs> and filling the place with poop. You've got to get clean. And then he says, improve. And I'm coming into land at Stansted via Berlin. Anyway, here we go. So, let us pure ourselves from everything that contaminates, but perfecting holiness. It's not just an inward look at what's wrong to sort it out. It's always in the context of he loves me, he's for me, he fathers me, he wills to be with me, he calls me, his says, it's in that context. And he's come to make, make his home with me. And I'm perfecting holiness and perfecting what is perfecting holiness well perfecting means making something perfect and holiness means perfect so it's perfecting perfection it's lovely isn't it and what is the standard of perfection it's not a what it's not a set of rules it's not a set of laws the perfection of perfection is a person and it's Jesus Religion's all do's and don'ts, but but a relationship with God is is all about Him. You know, I don't go around with these lists. I go about I am being conformed and transformed into the likeness of Him, and Jesus is the Holy One. The demons knew it. I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. You're the Holy One. He's the Holy One. So what? And therefore, He's the perfection of it. So perfecting holiness is becoming more like him becoming more like him who set up residence in us and he himself says be perfect as I am perfect now you could read that and think that is brutal or you could read it and say what an extraordinary invitation that God the Lord you know I me mean? he doesn't want to keep me as a creature or a cockroach or so he has made me his own and he wants me to become like him. Do you think Jesus was dull and boring? He's, 
He's the perfection of holiness. Do you think he was boring? Come on. Of course he wasn't. He was the person to be with. I mean, he brought the party. You know that. Jesus gives himself to us in bread and wine, not in a jug full of vinegar. Holiness is not sour-faced. Glad he's the heart we read about wine. I think Jesus was the most joyful, the most wonderful, the most remarkable to be around. That is holiness, and we're becoming like him. And how do we do it? Yeah, all right, but... Well, we've got to do what he tells us to do. We've got to do our bit. And we've got to put to death some of those sins and some of those habits. And, and uh, we've got to do what he tells us to do. And we've got to not do what he tells us not to do. And we've got to linger in his presence longer. And we've got to look at him if we're going to be like him. And then we ask for the Spirit. It's the presupposition of all that Paul says is that there is the Spirit. There is a spirit that enables us to do these things. And so we ask for more of him. Lord, help me. Give me more of you to be more like you. Give me your spirit. I need you to, I can't do this on my own. Send your spirit to speak to me and to transform me. And how much more? The Bible says if you're evil, if you know you're evil and how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's what pulls it all together. It's Him. More of Him and we can become more like Him. Well, God is good. God is with us. And uh, we're going to respond. I'm going to ask Will and Cookie to come and lead us. I think there are two main things here. Well, I only had two points, but there are two main things. God is pursuing you. Some of you don't know it. Some of you don't believe it. Some of you think, actually, if he was pursuing me and he was all the good things you said, my life wouldn't be such a mess. And that's it. He's let. Some of you are feeling like that, that God has let you down. God isn't with you. He's not pursuing you. And we want to pray for you this evening that by his spirit he'll come to you. And he'll just speak tenderly to you. You'll know that you know that he is for you. And then you've got to pursue him. And some of you know that there's stuff in your life that shouldn't be there. There isn't stuff that in your life that shouldn't be there. And God wants to send, see you mate, bless you, Amen. cheers. And God wants to send his spirit upon you so that you can become more like him and that you can walk in the spirit walking with the Lord so that you can end up looking more like him. Amen? Amen. I was going to invite the band up and they came up it was like magic <laughs> so let's stand and uh, perhaps we'll sing as we'll, we'll, we'll worship and then we'll tell us what we're going to do